Hey, good morning. We are continuing on, obviously, as the video you just watched showed you, we're continuing on in our series on prayer. And this week we were looking at uh, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The Lord's Prayer, looking at that line from the Lord's Prayer. And I think prayer is important for a whole lot of reasons, but I think one of the reasons why it's so important to us is because we are a people that have to deal with loss. We lose things, and I don't just mean like your keys in the morning, although that is a measure of grief, I suppose. But we lose things that we find attachment to, and we find attachment to all sorts of things. If you have a, a, a car that you really like, but it's an inanimate object, if you get in a car wreck, there's grief there. The car gets totaled, you're like, oh, I really liked that car, Right? A musical instrument, perhaps. A favorite chair. We get attached to things, but it goes even beyond that. We get attached to people, to relationships, to buildings, to seasons in our lives. We get attached to time periods. We get attached to things. And there's this compulsion within us to chase down that which we've lost, to, to try and either get it back or to have some measure of comfort we even miss things, we even lose things that we don't ever, we never really had in the first place, right? There's this attraction to us to all sorts of things that we never had. There's a, there's a whole uh, area of Wikipedia that talks about lost lands, both mythological lost lands like Atlantis or Avalon or El Dorado, the city of gold, and real lost lands. Like apparently, and I didn't realize this until this week, and it shows you what my sermon prep is like. I didn't realize that New, Ze New Zealand is actually a part of a continent that's completely submerged except for two mountains, which is basically New Zealand. Isn't that crazy? Britain used to be connected to Europe by a land bridge that's lost to us because it's completely submerged. And why do I find that fascinating? Why do I want to go see that? Why do I want to experience places I've never been before? And I, I get sad about the fact that I might never go there. We're people that struggle with loss. And prayer is one of the ways that we go to God and we cry out and we ask him to fix the loss in our life, we, to address the things we've lost. And so today what I want us to do is I want us to talk about the kingdom. Because the kingdom of God is a little bit like a lost land to us. In a lot of ways, it doesn't feel real. In a lot of ways, we don't know, is it mythical, is it not? In a lot of ways, we don't see how it impacts our daily life. And we certainly don't see how it's going to rectify the loss that we've experienced as we wait for the kingdom to come. And so today, we're going to be in Matthew. We'll start in chapter 6, verse 10, which is the Lord's Prayer. And then we'll move to chapter 13 and stay there for the rest of the time. But what I want us to do is I want us to talk about what is the, Lord, the kingdom? What is the kingdom? Where is the kingdom and then how do I find it? So first let's start with what is the kingdom? And it's one of the most elusive ideas in all of scripture. Jesus says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's teaching the disciples to pray and this is the second part. And I think the best way to understand it, kind of the lowest common denominator, if you're gonna talk about the kingdom, you gotta talk about the king. If you don't have a king, you don't have a kingdom. And the United States is not a kingdom, why? We don't have a king. I don't have to worry about what Queen Elizabeth says. You know why? There was a revolution. Maybe you heard about it. The little American part of us is like, yeah, 1776. We're all super excited about it. Jesus is the king. He's the king of kings. No king, no kingdom, right? And so what we need to think about it is not just that there's a king, but where God's rule is paramount, where the king's reign begins, where it perpetuates, that's where the kingdom is, right? So God's will is always accomplished. Think of it like a river. God's will is like a river. And it's going to get where it's going. And you can throw sticks in it, you can throw rocks in it, you can even build a dam, but over time, the river of God will eventually accomplish the purposes that it has set out. God is unstoppable. But notice the prayer says something on earth as it is in heaven. You see, in heaven, there is no opposition to the will of God. God says, God speaks, God desires, and the angels and the kingdom flourishes there. But on earth, we oppose God's will. 
We stand against it often. We find ourselves on the wrong side of it often. So we pray God will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And God's will, God's kingdom, is incredibly difficult to understand. There's a great author that I like. His name is Kenneth Bailey. And he wrote a great book called Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes. If you want to check it out, that's the title. It's basically a look at the Gospels through the perception of Middle Eastern culture. There's a sequel, interesting enough, called Paul Through Middle Eastern Eyes. Both good reads. And he talks about the kingdom is basically understood traditionally through four perspectives. And those are usually set against each other. But I think, and he thinks that you can just look at them through different, they're like different facets, different perspectives to have a better holistic understanding of what the kingdom is. So I wanna illustrate this to you today as we talk about what is the kingdom. The first is that the kingdom is eschatological. It's a big word. It just means the study of end times, the study of last things. And this idea kind of propagates uh, that, that Jesus, uh, the kingdom, is in some ways already here, but the full fruition of it will happen when Christ returns at the end of all things and sets up his throne in a new heaven and a new earth. Totally agree with that. That's basically what Revelation is about. That's Luke 17, as Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven. There's this idea of it's coming. You can't stop it. It's on the way. And this should give us great hope. Because if this kingdom is always coming, if the goal of all of history, both natural and human history, is towards this one event, the arrival of the kingdom, then when I turn on the news and I'm discouraged, or when I hear bad news about things going on in the world, you know what happens? I don't have to be completely deflated. I can go to the Lord in prayer. And when I say, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, I can say, Lord, I know that history is bringing to a conclusion this great kingdom that you're gonna establish and I don't have to lose faith. I don't, think that the, I don't have to think that the world is, is, is over. I don't think the world's going to hell in a handbasket. I don't have to lament necessarily about all the things in culture. Because I know that the king is at work. And I know that the kingdom is coming. And so all the sadness, all the brokenness, all the pain that we see in our world, we trust that God can change that into a, into a garden a fertile garden where his glory and his praise is raised up because he's gonna redeem those broken things when the kingdom comes. So that's the eschatological view and it helps us pray by praying about the things we see in history. The second is mystical. It's a mystical perspective. This is the idea that the kingdom is in our hearts. It's invisible. You can't see it. And it makes sense. Jesus, we, we, and we use language like this. I think it's predominantly probably our view uh, if not in our church, perhaps in our denomination, that, that Jesus is gonna come and set up his rule and reign in our hearts. So we ask Jesus into our heart. He sets up a throne in our heart and he rules and reigns. And so the idea of his will being done on earth as it is in heaven is that my life progressively becomes less and less opposed to Jesus' will in my life. So I accept Christ, I come to know him, I put my faith and my trust in his death, his burial and resurrection, and then the rest of my life is a progressive growth in accepting the will of God in my life and stopping uh, my resistance to it. And it makes sense how you would pray that prayer. It makes sense why you would pray along those lines. You would pray that God's will would be done in your life. You could pray that, that whatever addictions, whatever sins, whatever brokenness perpetuates itself in your life, you can ask that God would rescue, would redeem you from it. You can ask that, that God takes these wounds, these things that we've lost, because when, when we lose things, they leave deep scars in our lives. There's pain there. We can ask that God would, would redeem it, would rescue it, would transform it in our own lives. The depression, the anxiety, the worry that we feel, we can ask God to cultivate it, to change it, for his kingdom to come in our lives. Ultimately, you pray for flourishing in your own life, but you can't stop there. You can't just stop with your own heart. You've gotta pray about the hearts of other people because our God, our king, is a conquering king. He's not satisfied with just your heart. He wants the hearts of your neighbors. He wants the hearts of your employees. He wants the hearts of your coworkers. He wants the hearts of your family. And so we pray that God would, would extend the boundaries, the borders of his kingdom into the lives of those around us, in our neighborhoods, in our countries, around the world. You can't stop there. 
So the kingdom of heaven is eschatological. It's about in things, but it's also about what happens inside of us, right? But it's also a third way is political. Now, when I say political, people get nervous. It's okay. We're going to get through this together. I promise. The view that political means politics is an extremely narrow view of politics, okay? Political is not necessarily just restricted to what happens in a government and what happens in elections, although historically, that is how people have associated the kingdom of God with a political perspective. Because historically, people have, have identified a nation or a kingdom and said, this is God's physical representation of the kingdom on earth. For a long time, it was the Roman Empire, Constantine. The Roman Empire is the kingdom of God on earth. Then it was associated with a group called the Holy Roman Empire. During the Crusades, it was all of Christendom, right? And so the Crusades went and fought against the Muslims. Why? Because that was the kingdom of God striving against that which was not the kingdom of God. It even happens in our day and age. We have a propensity to view the United States as a manifestation of the kingdom of God. And we desire that because we are patriots and we try to resolve this tension between our relationship to the Lord and a relationship to a nation. It's even part of our history, right? The, the, one of the very first colonists that came here decided they wanted uh, the United States or the Americas to be a city on a hill, shining light out into the rest of the world. We still have that perspective, but it's too narrow of a view of political kingdom of heaven because politics aren't just governmental structures. Politics are crime, justice, ecology, law, Politics are any human interaction with other people. And we have systems in place to help us navigate that. And so we desire to see the kingdom of God, his will and his reign working throughout the things that we've put in place. So things like law, law should be practiced to uphold kingdom ideas. Do we practice law that way? Do we seek justice? Or do we seek victory in a courtroom? And those are different things. You can win a court case without being just. There are loopholes in laws because they're designed by imperfect people. Do we seek justice as a people founded on law? Do we pray for peace between races, between ethnicities, between cultures? Do we pray that God would, would bring healing to racial divisions? I know that they're in our country now and in our culture there's racial division, there's racial strife. And a lot of it's over terms. We get, we get worked up, we really do, over terms like Black Lives Matter and about uh, deconstruction and we get worked up uh, about critical race theory. And I'm not gonna talk about that today as much as perhaps we want me to. But what I am gonna say is this, maybe if we had spent more time praying that the kingdom of God would come in our racial relationships, we wouldn't need those other things. People wouldn't feel like they need those other things. There's a war brewing between Russia and Ukraine. Are we praying about that? Yeah, it doesn't necessarily involve us, but it involves us because we're humans. And there are going to be people that don't know the Lord dying in a conflict like that. Are we praying for peace? Or are we just ignoring it? Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't happen to us. Are we praying that God would free people who are wrongfully convicted? You know, Jesus had a cousin who was wrongfully imprisoned. His name was John the Baptist, and he was wrongfully executed. Do we sympathize with our Lord in that? Jesus was wrongfully arrested. Or are we afraid to pray this way? Because it, what might it mean for us? Are we scared to see the kingdom come in this way? Do we really mean your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? The fourth is institutional. This has largely been carried by the church, this view. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church has carried it for a long time, uh, that they are the kingdom of God on earth. Uh, we've kind of extended it out to the rest of, of, of Christianity, right? And there's some truth there. You see it in scripture when Jesus hands the, the keys of the kingdom uh, over to Peter. That's where they get their, their idea. But we, we have a viewpoint as well uh, that, that our brand of Christianity is really the true kingdom of God, right? 
I mean, we, we have discussions, debates. We have a history of arguing with other denominations. We race the Methodists to Lubies. It's okay. We like to think that our ways at Park City's Baptist Church are better than some of the other ways at other churches. And that's natural, right? I mean, this is where we attend church. We love this place. But sometimes we can love something to the point where it's exclusive and we don't support the work of God in other places. May that never become us. So we need to pray that God's will would be done in our institutions, not just our church, but our schools, our communities, our governments, courtrooms. Pray that God would work in our, our businesses, in our stock market. God has a history of working through human institutions. He worked through a king named David, a monarchy. He worked through a priesthood of imperfect people, right? He worked through pagan empires like Assyria, Babylon, Egypt. He can work through our institutions as well. But remember that most institutions, if all institutions really, if they weren't founded by human beings, they're still worked and run by human beings. And we are not perfect, which means our institutions are not perfect. They make mistakes. It doesn't make them bad institutions. It makes them in human. And so as we pray that God's will would be done, that his kingdom would come on earth that is in heaven, we need to look at the, the institutions that we are part of and look for, not be blind to the things that maybe we've allowed to go on that are not propagating the ideas of the kingdom of heaven. Pray that God would open our eyes to see the injustice that our institutions perpetuate. We've got to pray for our institutions. We absolutely should. So those are the four views of the kingdom. And I hope that you can use those to kind of get a better idea of what the kingdom is. It's this beautiful realm run by a king where his will is being done. And it's coming, but in some ways it's already here. And part of our responsibility as Christians is to make sure that, that it infects and, and moves into all these different areas of our lives, in our own hearts, in our institutions, and in our actions with other people. But moving on, we need to talk about where we can find the kingdom. Where is the kingdom? We're going to be Matthew 13, verses 31 to 33. And the great thing is that Jesus talks a lot about the kingdom. I think it's one of the reasons why it's so hard to get an idea, because he talks so much about it. There's so many competing ideas, even within what Jesus is saying. It's hard to understand. But Jesus' central message of his entire ministry was this. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, I don't mean repent like Jesus is standing on a corner outside a football game and beating people overhead with a, with a, with a Bible. That's not what he means by Repent. Repentance in Jesus' mind was acknowledge him as Savior and Lord. So abandon whatever it is that you're looking to save you, whatever broken thing you're putting your trust in, whether it's your good works, whether it's your good ideas, whether it's just I'm a nice person, abandon that and instead turn to Christ for the only thing you need to have a relationship with God. That's what Jesus means by repent. And that idea was so unpopular that when Jesus talked about it, he sometimes had to teach in code through parables. And parables are little short stories that have characters that represent other ideas and other concepts, okay? And so Jesus teaches a lot in parables, and the idea behind them was that if you were one of Jesus' followers, or you were one of his insiders, or you were even somebody that wanted to know more about what he was talking about and you sought him out, you could understand the parable. You could be taught to understand the parable. But if you were an enemy, it remained hidden. He didn't have to explain it to you. So it was a brilliant way of teaching in a, in a place that people maybe weren't as popular, uh, didn't like what you had to say. And so Jesus presents two of them in Matthew 13, verse 31. He put another parable before them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Pretty straightforward. Man sows a seed, grows into a plant, birds rest there. Woman makes some bread, sows in some leaven, or works in some leaven. It grows up into some dough that, that, that feeds a bunch of people. Very similar stories. But what's the point here? What's the moral of the story? Both of these stories are about hidden things, things that are hidden, sprouting and becoming uh, uh, spectacular growth happening, amazing growth happening. 
in both stories, there's something tiny to start that's hidden. The seed's in the dirt, the leaven is in the dough, and it explodes into this great thing that becomes something you can't pass over, you can't ignore it because it's so big and it's so influential. And it leads to uh, people being taken care of. The birds have a place to shelter and rest in the tree. The dough becomes bread, and, and apparently, according to what I read, this is enough to feed a small village. So it takes care of people. So how does this help us find the kingdom, Travis? Well, I think there's two ideas here. One, the kingdom is hidden. It's small. It almost seems lost to us. That's the thing about lost lands, things like Atlantis and Avalon. They're hidden. We can't go there. I can't find it. I can't get my passport stamped in Atlantis. It's lost to us. It's missing, if it ever existed in the first place. We live in an era where hidden things are largely ignored. The small things are not talked about, nor are they praised. People want more. They want more followers. They want more friends. They want more money. They want more stuff. You know why I think we want all this stuff, this more, 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 more? I'll tell you why. Because if we're on a pursuit of something more, It distracts us from the fact that we have pain that we've lost. Pain that we've lost something. And so if I can just get enough, I won't hurt over the loss in my life anymore. I won't be wounded anymore by the relationship I had with my parents or with a spouse. I won't be hurt anymore that I don't have those things. So I just need to get and get and get. And the bigger they are, the more distracted we become until we get what we want and then we're not satisfied. The Bible has this nasty habit, God, it's frustrating, where it keeps talking about God working through small, insignificant things. It's annoying. I want God to work through big things. He works through Abraham and Sarah, this elderly couple that weren't capable of having kids, and guess what? They have a kid that's the founder of a nation and the ancestor of the savior of the world. David is the last brother. He's unimpressive. He's not even invited to the king of Israel job interview. He didn't even get a call back. God has to like override it. He's like, nah, there's another kid, Samuel, come on. Elijah asks for God to work, to speak to him. And God doesn't appear in a hurricane or in an earthquake. He appears in a whisper. And our savior was born in a podunk town in a part of the world that we probably wouldn't even remember unless he was born there. Why do we consistently think, despite what God teaches us, despite what he's shown us throughout his history of working with people, why do we continue to think that God works through big things? He can, sure. Absolutely he can. But why do we ignore the hidden things, the small things? Those are the levers that can upend the entire world the small ones. It's because we don't want tiny things. We want big things because they distract us. We get disappointed when God gives us small tasks because we want to do great things for God. We want to change the world. Do you know that phrase, change the world, never appeared in human history until like the 1900s? Nobody was interested in changing the world. There's a better phrase than change the world. Seek the kingdom. Seek the kingdom. God desires to work through small things. Second idea behind small things is that we need to look for flourishing. So we need to look for small things to find the kingdom and we need to look for flourishing where there's life. Atlantis, Avalon, El Dorado, these places were utopias. Nobody wants to go to Atlantis because we think like, oh man, that place was rough. No, we want to rediscover it because we want to see what kind of great these people lived, right? In every story about a lost land, there was always this utopia, this magnificent place. In the stories that Jesus tells, the parables, trees house birds, dough feeds people. That's flourishing. Those are needs being met, which I had a friend point out to me after the last service that by saying the dough feeds people, it meets needs. Is pointing out that it's a pun. I didn't catch it either. But you need the dough. Yeah. That... 
is life springing forward. And you know why life has to accompany the kingdom? It's because our king is alive. Our king defeated death. He was crucified. He was buried. And guess what? Just like the, sea, the, the dirt can't keep the seed in the ground, death can't keep our king in the ground. He's raised to life and there is life in the kingdom. So wherever there is life or there's flourishing, that's where the kingdom of heaven is. We can look and we can be like, hey, I think something's sprouting over there. Those hidden things. So when we pray, we gotta pray about the small things. You are not trained by our culture, by our society, to look for the small things. Our culture points our eyes up. We walk through a forest that is our lives and we're called to look at the big trees, the big trestles. Look up. But God wants us to look down, to see the forest floor, because that's where new life is sprouting. That's where the saplings are growing up, and we miss them because we're obsessed with the big things. Only God makes trees grow. Only God makes bread rise. And he wants to guide your eyes to the forest floor to show you the world, the new world coming. Pray that God would use small things in your life. Pray that the small devotional the, you, you do the 15 minute devotional that you feel kind of guilty about that you really only do it about four times a week. Pray that God would use that small little seedling of word of scripture in your life to flourish and sprout a tree that your entire family for generations would come and rest under. The great godly wisdom and righteousness that you acquire in those scarce times with the Lord. Pray that God would take new believers little shallow new believers and grow them into mighty oaks, rich in faith. Pray that God would take people with seemingly little power and influence and that they would upend the things in our world that oppress. Ask God to guide your eyes to the forest floor. Pray that God would take that which is old. Our church, our church is not young. <laughs> it was founded in 1939. It is right for us to pray that God would take this place and that he would be gracious enough to give us new life again and again and again. That's where the kingdom is. So let's talk about how we find it, how we find it. Jesus tells two more stories, verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up and then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Both of these stories are about one thing about how you find the kingdom of God. They're about sacrifice, about giving up to gain. Now you might sit there and be like, well, Travis, these two people are buying something that's supremely valuable. This isn't sacrifice, this is investment. They're gonna, they're gonna, they, they, they're, 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 this is a good business deal. They've taken something that people undervalued and they rightly valued it and they took advantage of it. Here's the problem. And I read the passage the same way you just did until I got a little help. May God give us eyes to see because these people that have bought a field with treasure and a pearl of great price, you know what they're not doing with those things? They're not reselling them. This isn't about profit, it's about possession. They're not going to get something else. They've given up everything they have to acquire this, to possess it, and hold on to it. They're not flipping the pearl of great price. They're not gonna mark it up and sell it. He's not gonna work the field and get something out of it. He's just sitting on the treasure because that's the most valuable thing to have. He's just sitting on the pearl because that's the most valuable thing to have. It's about possession, it's not about profit. I find lost lands fascinating. Clearly, I've talked about them all morning. I think it's really interesting. And what I, what, what I think would be fascinating is, let's say you and I went to lunch, and we were talking about maybe what we're reading, and I was like, hey, I'm kind of on this kick right now about discovering lost lands, and I'd talk to you about it for a while, and you'd either think that was fascinating, or you'd look at your watch and be like, wow, I've really got to get back to the office, Travis, and we'd only been to lunch for 15 minutes because you were trying to get away from me, and that's Okay. I've had bad dates before. It's fine. But most, most of you would sit there and you would listen to me and you'd be like, oh, that's cool, Travis. That's cool that you're interested in like, that historical fact and whatever. And then we'd go on about our day. But what if at that lunch I told you 
hey, I've been reading about the lost city of El Dorado. It's really fascinating kind of going on. And then I closed with saying, and I think I'm going to sell everything and I'm going to find El Dorado. You would, rightfully so, look at me like I had lost my mind. And if you love me and you love my wife, you would call her and you would ask her two questions. Do you know about Travis's plan and are your names on the, uh, on the documents for your home and your bank accounts? And if you're a lawyer, please help my wife navigate that. You would look, like I was, you'd look at me like I was crazy. Because crazy people go after missing kingdoms of gold. There's a reason why Nicolas Cage played that guy in National Treasure, right? Like, come on. But listen to me and hear me well, those of us who live in North Dallas. Most of the Christians you meet, most of the ones you spend time with, maybe even some of the very people you share your home with, they are amused by the kingdom. When you talk about it, when you look at it, when you think about it, they, are, they like the king. They like the king that wants to come and bless their home. They like the king that wants to give them eternal life. They like that king. But when you actually start seeking the kingdom, when you tell them that you're gonna start sacrificing, that you're gonna say no to advancement, you're gonna say no to more, 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 that you're gonna say no to stop trying to bury your hurt and your lost in the acquirement of more and more things. When you tell them that, they will look at you like you'd look at me if I said I was gonna go to El Dorado. Because the person that seeks the kingdom that way, that seeks first the kingdom of God and trusts God to add other things to him, that person to the world is crazy. And their response to you in those moments will tell you all you need to know about their views of the kingdom. And if you're wondering what your thoughts are on the kingdom, how did you respond when I started talking about sacrifice? We like the kingdom, but we really like to live on the outskirts. We like to live on the borders of the realm. Just enough to have protection, but not enough to where the king can reach out and really change our lives. The king stands before you today with an invitation, and he doesn't want you to just move closer. He wants you to move into the palace where his rule and his reign will restore to you one day Maybe not all that you've lost, but it'll wipe away the tears and the pain that you feel from the losses that you've suffered. And when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it is a cry of faith and a cry for comfort and a cry of, Lord God, one day you are gonna restore all these broken things, all this injustice that has taken place. You're gonna right the ship. And so come soon, Lord Jesus. And until then, we sacrifice, we live below our means, we choose to live differently, we are straight up weird until the king returns. Jesus tells us to deny, take up our cross and follow him. You know why I know the kingdom is accessed by sacrifice? It's because that's how it was founded. It was founded on the sacrifice of our king. So why do we think that there's sacrifice not involved. Why do we ignore that part of Jesus' call in our lives? Let's have a heart of repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Stop trying to find the things that you've lost and gaining more things. Instead, find the things that you've lost and the only one that can redeem and restore them, Jesus Christ. His kingdom is a part of every single facet of our lives. Every single part. He wants to rule and reign in yours. So where do we find it? We find it in hidden things. Where there's life, where there's flourishing. And if you want to know if the kingdom is sprouting in your life, do people find you life-giving? And if not, there's a place to pray that the kingdom would come in your life. And we acquire it by sacrifice. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for a kingdom that will never end, a kingdom that we get to be a part of. And Lord, it may seem lost to us today. It may seem far off. It may seem just as fairy tale as Atlantis. Lord God, give us eyes to see that it's real and it's coming. It's already, it's not yet, and our King is on the way. 
Lord God, may we have the courage, may you give us the grace to pack up and to move closer to the king, to live in the very palace that we might have our lives ruled and reigned by our king. And yeah, it might cost us something, but may you show us it'll be worth it in the end. And it's the name of the one who founded the kingdom to begin with. It's in his name we pray, amen.